Hi, I'm Gabriel Carrillo from the EdTech Bytes podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of My Ed Tech Life at your usual Wednesday time. So thank you so much for all of you that are joining us, wherever in the world it is that you are watching us from, where you're joining us from. Thank you so much for all of your support. Thank you so much for making My Ed Tech Life what it is today and know that we do what we do for you. And today I am excited because I get to interview a very special guest who is from my area here in the Rio Grande Valley. And she is just a wealth of knowledge. She is so, she's amazing. She has an amazing personality, the way that she connects with adults, the way that she connects with children. She does some amazing work with various districts, not only here in the Valley, but also upstate here in Texas and who knows where the doors will open up because she is a phenomenal, phenomenal resource, educator, mom, grandma. She is like this package. And sometimes I don't even know where she finds enough hours of the day to do what she does. But I am excited to introduce to you a very special friend, Dr. Edith Trevino, otherwise known as Dr. E.T. Dr. E.T., how are you doing today? Muchas gracias. I'm super excited to be here with you, Fonsi. And I just want to let people know that uh, we met back in 2016 uh, when I was just barely learning how to be a net tech person. And you were there to support me and my team. Uh, I'm always grateful for that. Siempre bien humilde, a great person, always trying to help us out whichever way that you could. Y eso nunca... Nunca se me olvida. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. E.T. You are amazing. And like I said, just those connections, being able to connect with you, you know, years back and now being able to connect with you again. But now as a guest on my podcast, I'm definitely honored. Like I said, this is season two of my podcast. We finished up 100 episodes. This is episode three of the second season. And again, I couldn't think of a better way to start the season with a bang, with some amazing guests. So Dr. E.T., for all of our friends that are currently watching right now or will hear the replay later who may not be familiar with your work, can you please give us a brief introduction and your context in education? And if you can, could you add one little interesting fact about yourself that people may not know? Okay, so... First of all, I'm a code switcher, which means I love to speak in English and Spanish. However, of course, I love all languages. So I'm trying to learn a couple so that I can kind of code switch in different uh, languages. Um, I'm kind of like what we would say in Mexico, la milusos. You know, I have a lot of experiences because I've done a lot of things, you know. Um, so I've been in the Army Reserves. Um, I've been a bilingual teacher, ESL teacher, elementary teacher, middle school teacher, ESL teacher of adults. Um, you know, I've done pretty much all of that. Um, what people don't know about me, I guess, um, well, I guess I always share with people that I was in the Army. So sometimes people don't believe me. I had a student once uh, in a district, first grader. She said, I don't believe that you were in the Army. I said, hold on during break. I'm going to show you a picture, okay? And then when she saw the picture, she's like, it doesn't look like you. I said, well, of course it doesn't look like me. It's 30 years ago. Um, uh, I just recently became a grandmother nine months ago. So I'm super excited about that. I love culture and I love language and I love people that are different. Um, I don't like perfection. I, I like to be human, you know? Um, I like to say no manches a lot, y la mera neta, things like that. Um, you know, and I, I mean, I live in, in South Texas. I've lived on the border my entire life. I was born in Mexico, Coahuila. And um, that's why on my Twitter, it's Dr. E.T. on the border. Technically, because I'm always on the border, but I'm always on the border of everything, trouble y todo, right? Um, the only time I was not in the border was when I was in the United States Army and when I went to college in Pennsylvania for three years. But other than that, my vida has been on the border from very, uh, from, from 
Brownsville, Texas, all the way to El Paso, toda esa frontera. I've lived it. Oh, that is wonderful. So I'm really excited. And like I said, you know, your story is just phenomenal. Your experience is phenomenal. And I definitely want to just dive in. As part of our show, I always love to have our guests here and really just get to know that human aspect and know their origin story. I know you already told us a little bit where you were born and, you know, in uh, Coahuila, which my mother, she's from Torreon, Coahuila. So oh. yes, originally from Torreon, Coahuila. So that's exciting that, you know, we have that commonality, but also just like you, you know, I've been living my life here along the border this whole time, born and raised. And so it's a different cultura. Like you said, we do a lot of code switching where we can go back and forth from English to Spanish. And, you know, it's just something that's very unique to our area, which I love. But I want to know just a little bit more about your origin story. You know, coming into now, you know, you have a doc, you've earned your doctorate degree. Now you're doing just some amazing work with, um, you know, a lot of districts locally and districts also upstate in Texas. But was it always your dream to go into education or was it something that you kind of fell into and then just fell in love with? I love that question because I, education was never in my plans ever. Okay. Um, my intention in high school was to graduate high school and go work with my dad. He used to sell used cars. Um, and I remember in high school, people would ask me even for the yearbook, what are your plans when you graduate high school? And I would say, oh, I'm going to go to college. But uh, I was like, yeah, right. I'm, I don't even know how to even start, you know, the process. Now, when I was in fifth grade, I had a teacher um, and I wrote about it in Rethinking Bilingual Education. It was published uh, way back um, where I write about the death of my Mexican name. My, my real name is Maria Edith. A lot of people don't know that I'm ET just because I feel I don't have a name, you know. Um, so that story kind of changed my life because my teacher made me choose in front of my classmates. If you read that um, that article, she said, we're not in Mexico anymore. It's either Maria or Edith. And it's either Espinosa or Yepes, which is it going to be right now? Decide, you know. Um, so at the moment, I was like, well, I don't want to be Maria because growing up, um, all I knew was La India Maria. And she wasn't portrayed as as a positive. You know, she was portrayed as ignorant. And and so I was like, well, I don't want to be Maria. And OK, Edith. Well, it didn't. It wasn't Edith. It was Edith, you know. So that's like a part of my story. But um, so as an elementary student, I was a really good student. Middle school, I was a really good student. High school, I kind of fell through the, the cracks. Um, I, w I was senior class president. Um, and some, you know, some situations happened in school where I actually failed um, some class that we needed to graduate, some computer math class. So you see why I was so scared of technology for the longest time. And I failed it with a 69.9. OK, 60, no, I'm lying, 69.3. I fell through the, the cracks. I failed. I could not graduate. Um, my parents were very upset with me, very disappointed. Um, I ended up graduating in the summer and nobody went to my graduation because, you know, I remember asking my dad, Papi, vas a ir a mi graduación? And he was like, no, you know, esa graduación no cuenta. That graduation doesn't count. The one that counted was the one in May, you know. I remember I went graduation by myself. Um, again, I had no plans. Okay. I mean, I would tell people I was going to go to college, but, you know, I had no plans. Um, so what happened is I, I decided to join the Army. And I wasn't able to join active duty right away. So the only option I had was a reservist. And then I could wait and then try again. Um, so I was like, yeah, I need to get out of here. You know, I, I and, and then as most immigrants, what we do, I mean, I'm speaking for most of the immigrants that I know, is I just wanted to give back. You know, I don't want nobody coming back to me telling me, hey, you, you got here from Mexico and you were here taking from us, even though we never took anything because my parents were very proud. I wanted to say, you know what? I served my time. Thank you for giving me an education. Now I'm going to give back to you. So, so I joined the Army. And this is a story that I've shared couple of times, very few times. So I joined the army and I remember we'd had to wake up four in the morning. We had to go running all through the base. And there was a base. Um, the base had like the fancy area and then the regular area. Through the regular area, we were supposed to be crazy loud, obnoxiously loud. And then once we got to the fancy area, we had to be super quiet. And I remember asking my roommate, my bunk mate, she was from California, and I remember asking her, how, how come when we're in this part of the base, we have to be quiet, and when we're on the other part of the base, we have to be super loud? And she said, because 
where we have to be super quiet, those people are officers. I said, okay, well, what's the difference between them and us? She said, well, you and me are enlisted. Those people are officers. And I said, okay, what does that mean? She said, they have a college education, you know? And I was like, what? She's like, yeah, so they can live in the fancy houses. They can go to the fancy restaurants. We can't do any of those things. We can't go there. We can't live there. That to me was my aha moment. I remember thinking, I don't want anybody to ever tell me who I can talk to, where I can sit, where I can live. And then it was in the army that I started thinking, well, maybe I can go to college. Maybe I can. And back then, Fonzie, you know, back then we didn't have Google ni nada. We had to like submit the application by hand. Yeah. I applied. Everybody was like, no, 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 no. Because of course I failed high school. So it was UTEP that accepted me under probation status. So I ended up at UTEP. I was at the base there. Um, and then from there, I moved to Pennsylvania. I, I graduated. Um, I was one of the only students that had passed some teacher tests that nobody could pass. And I was like, wow, okay, maybe maybe I am smart. But the system failed me, you know? I never had a teacher. It was actually it was my senior year in May, a teacher telling me, you have what it takes, you're super smart. And I'm thinking, nobody ever told me that before, you know? And so it was at that moment that I said, I never want anybody to fall through the cracks like I did. You know, I have dear friends who attended Harvard, who attended, um, you know, top universities in the, in the United States. Um, and they also struggled with people not telling them, but at least they had a guide. I had no guidance at all. And so I don't want anybody to ever go through that. So my philosophy in life is not how you start, but how you finish. I was last in my class. I really was. I was like, out of 550, I was like number 500. Um, I big time fell through the cracks. So when people ask me, did you always want to become a teacher? How did you decide? I decided when I was in the army, running at four in the morning. Wow. That is such a powerful, powerful story, Dr. E.T. And like I said, it really gives a testament of what you've been through and now what you've done and what you've accomplished and what you, you know, and the things that you've seen, you know, the uh, going from, you know, the system failing you and now getting motivated and saying, hey, that's what I'm going to do. You went after it and you persevered, you graduated. And not only that, but the fact that you said you you passed the teacher examination that not many people could pass. And then now here you are today, well, you know, extreme, you know, and I, I'm going to be honest, you know, because when I see your work, it's like, I see the level of passion that you bring to your profession and to what you do. And I think that, you know, just what you've gone through, you can see that. And you're absolutely right. Like your message. And when I see everything that you do on social media, and when you're working with schools, you really do genuinely care and you don't want people to fall through the cracks, whether it no. is that you're working mm -hmm. with kids and even as adults, when you're training them as well, that passion comes out. So wow. that's something that's wonderful that you exude. Thank you so much. And thank you that you recognize that. I That is my my passion. And hi, I'm so glad to see Manny. Manny Garces is here. So good to see him. Uh, another amazing individual. Um, and, and yeah, you're right. I'm very passionate. I don't want anybody to fall through the cracks. I don't want anybody to ever feel um, that they're less than because, you know, of their culture or their heritage or because they're different or because they don't pronounce things the perfect way, you know. Um, and then I and then also at the same time, at the same token, I want teachers to be able to see those amazing individuals, you know, that come into our classrooms that come from a very difficult background, you know, and sometimes teachers might not realize that that one day will be an amazing kid. We just got to give them that chance. Exactly. And that's the thing. It's just about giving them those chances. So let's talk a little bit, you know, going back and like you've hit this, you know, we've talked a little bit about just code switching, you know, translanguaging and going, getting into the doctoral program. I'll be honest with you. I never had heard the term translanguaging, but now doing a lot of research and, you know, in Dr. Jewett's class. So big shout out to Dr. Jewett. I love you know, Dr. Jewett. <laughs> she is amazing. And, you know, she it's is. just very interesting. Just the way she allows you to really just take ownership of your learning and really just go out there and, and get out of your comfort zone. But in working with some of my classmates, you know, I, I never realized that when I came into teaching, I didn't go through a traditional, you know, college of ed. You know, I graduated with a business degree, came in from business into education, but nobody really taught me, you know, how to, what a standard was or how to unpack a teak and so on until 
much, much later in my career. And then once I kind of moved down to elementary, going from high school to elementary, the only thing that I remember saying is like, English only, English only, English only. And to me, I was like, this is, this is unusual. I was like, this is weird to me because I'm communicating with the student. They're still giving me the right answer, but it was, oh no, there has to be in English. I was like, I just don't get it. So can you share maybe a little bit about what we normally see? Or maybe, I don't know if that, that's still common practice today as, you know, I haven't been in the classroom, but what are some things that we can do well, better? It's not, number one, is it's not common practice, but people don't know better because of the historical trauma that has happened to us, you know? So for many years, maybe like, um, I mean, I don't have generations of family here because I'm a um, an immigrant, right? But like, let's say like maybe your parents or your great grandparents or, or, or friends that we might have when they were little, if they were speaking Spanish, you know, I've heard of people that they would get hit with a ruler. I mean, they would hit them. Um, I had a, a, a friend tell me that when she was a kid in elementary, she was speaking Spanish with her sisters and her teacher took off her high heel and hit her with it. You know, this was in the seventies. So a lot of that negativity right has kind of crossed over to the new generation so this is what i do when i go to sessions i tell teachers language is a civil right and actually if we tell teachers if we tell students english only we're actually breaking uh and going against their civil right they could actually sue us okay now we can actually tell a child english only only if it's an educational justification like this is the test you have to give me the words in english but like you're saying students need to use their language to be able to support each other you know so for example um i was at a campus um at a charter school close to houston and i was there observing and mentoring and uh you know there was a spanish speaking the, t the teacher had these rocks and it was during COVID. actually it was one of the first districts that hired me during after COVID. and this the teacher had these rocks and she laid them out and so the little girl that spoke spanish said to the other little girl uh this esta piedra parece carne you know because of the colors right and even though the teacher didn't speak spanish i love how she validated that she spoke in spanish right and so um, the little girl says, Miss, she says that it looks like me. And she said, I love that you would say that. That's great. You know, she wasn't like English only. We cannot do that. And so, again, um, that's a policy that exists. Um, you know, uh, language is a civil right. We can if I can speak whatever language I want. And what I tell teachers is imagine if you if imagine if you were in a different country. Imagine if you were in France and you were te learning French and that's the only language that you knew, that English, right? How are you gonna ask people? What, what, what is my teacher saying? You're gonna have to ask in your own language for clarification, right? And the research tells us that our first language helps us learn our second, right? So we have to continue uh, learning our, our language, our, using our language. Um, so translanguaging is very important. It is not, it's not a negative code switching people, you know, um, Dr. Jose Medina has said it a thousand times and I love how he says it, um, that people consider it pocho and pocho actually means like a rotten fruit, but actually code switching is higher cognitive thinking. It's a high order skill. And so when people are like, Hey, por qué hablas así? I say, excuse me, it's code switching. It's a high order cognitive skill. And in the world of academia, it's called translanguaging. So it's kind of like you educate people. We have to educate people. And um, you know what you're saying about this English only mentality in our schools? You know what that does to our kids? It takes away their culture. It takes away who they are. It's like saying you're Spanish and who you are is not good enough. So stop. And it breaks my heart when I go into a district and I'll ask kids, does anybody here know Spanish when I know that they do? And they say no. And then I go into my session and I start showing off the language and the beauty of the language. And then I ask them again, who here speaks Spanish? And they all raise their hand. Even some that don't, they're like, I, I don't know Spanish, but I want to learn, you know, because it's how we portray it. If we portray it as a negative, then of course kids are going to see it as a negative. I mean, there's countries all over the world where they, people have to learn at least two or three languages. So this is what I feel about language, okay? I feel that people that tell us we shouldn't know two languages or three or four, 
is because they want us to stay limited. Think about it. The more languages you know, the more powerful you are. The more people you can communicate with, the more jobs you can have, the more competitive you can be at a global scale. So when somebody says to me, you know, um, English only here, no, you're not going to limit me because my language is my civil right. I can speak English, Spanish. I know a little bit of French. Um, and, and if I want to use it, I want to use it. That's perfect. That's, that yeah. No, and that's so wonderful. And like I said, and, and the only reason I brought that up is because I know like for yourself, you wrote a book, this is something that you studied and this is something that you're passionate about too. But, you know, like I said, coming into teaching, I was I only did what I was told to do, but it wasn't until later on, I was yes. like, hey, you know what? Like, this is my classroom and I know where they're coming from because many of you, I've shared the story many times because I always go back to growing up here and being, you know, first generation, only child, mind you also, and then being a, being the language broker for yes. my parents. And that's something that a lot of people are not familiar with. Even that term language broker, that I learned that now through my doctoral studies. But if you're not sure what a language broker is, is pretty much my parents would get the mail or any important documents. And because I was seven, eight years old and already learning English in second grade, because I didn't learn English until really until I was in second grade where I was really immersed, they're kind of like, um, can you translate this for me? Dime lo que dice. And you're talking about an eight-year-old reading important documents that if you don't know what you're saying or kind of you can cause some big trouble if it's maybe a, a bill that's passed due or some kind of information. So the pressure is on to make sure that you're you're able to translate the language properly and one of the stories that I always love to share that always sticks in, in my mind is when my teacher in second grade would say, well, we, you need to practice your reading in English. So your homework is go home and you're going to read 20 minutes to your parents. And I'm thinking to myself, pues, my parents no entienden. They don't understand what I'm going to say. But I remember getting home, my my dad and my mom putting chairs right there in front of me so they can watch me. And I'm reading, but they don't know what I'm saying. Y pobrecitos, like I would just see them just smiling and nodding, like just acknowledging. They probably didn't even know what I was saying, but maybe in that moment they were just thinking like, look at him. Like he, like they were proud that I was speaking English because that's what they wanted for me and from me. And, you know, so those are some of the things that I grew up with being here in the border. You mentioned, uh, you know, people getting, you know, hit on the hand with their, on, you know, with rulers, we had, I think it's a mutual friend of ours too, Omar Lopez, who was a guest on the show too, who came from Mexico. And those are some of the things that, that he went through where he would get a little, you know, on the wrist with a ruler because he wasn't speaking the language. And I think that now we really need to respect that and respect those differences. And that's something that's very important nowadays. And uh, I, I love how you mentioned the word language broker, because you know, I tell people, your students come into your classrooms and they are professional translators. And you're right. They're translating things at the doctor's office. They're translating things at the banks. You know, they even have to, you know, this reminds me of a story um, when I was in third grade and my my father had gone shopping to like a, it was like a Home Depot, but it was like a mom and shop store. And he was very upset. And so, um, you know, the owner was an Americano, right? So my dad's like, Quiero que le digas esto y esto. And he called the man over. And, you know, it wasn't very nice things. And I was a little kid. I'm like, I'm not going to tell this man all these ugly things my dad is saying, right? So I had to navigate what to say, you know, to be politically correct and not be, you know. And so the man was very, you know, I said, oh, my father um, wanted to return, you know, whatever. And my dad was like, ¿Por qué no le estás diciendo lo que te di? You know, because it was crazy things my dad wanted to say. And I was like, I, I, it's like, I feel I feel like I was betraying my dad, but I I as a human I couldn't say those things, you know. Um, so yeah, kids kids they come into our classroom and they come with a lot of assets that people don't even know. Don't and don't even go there with the experiences that they have endured in their little lives, um, just to be in our classrooms, right? So I, I love how you validate that and. And yes, you know, the experiences like like Omar had, as, as you mentioned, that is the experience of many teachers whenever I bring up the topic. You know, I had a teacher share with me. She was in second grade. 
Um, and it was here in the region, you know, she said I was in second grade. I gave my answer in Spanish. She said, and the teacher got the, the eraser and she threw it at me and she said English only. And she said, ma'am, you know what? I started crying and I, and I actually wet my pants. She said, not because um, I was, she hurt me with the eraser. She said, but because I was so embarrassed because all of my classmates were looking at me like Spanish was bad. And she said, and, and there are people like that, that use that as a powerful tool. I mean, I may see como no hablar, you know? And so in her situation, I made sure my kids spoke Spanish and I spoke, you know, but there's people that that has happened to them. And they're like, I don't, I don't want that to happen to my kids. Um, so I'm going to make sure that I don't teach it to my kids uh, and this and that. Yeah. So I think um, the first step is just validating, you know, all cultures, all languages, honor, because, you know, I think for myself, uh, Fonzie, if if somebody would have taken my culture away from me, you know, my, my language, uh, who would I be? You know, and that's all I have that I can say is truly mine. Um, and I'm grateful for the United States. I mean, I served in the military, I'm, but my culture is my culture. And how dare anybody want to take that away from a child? That's just uh, robbing them. That's, that's what it is. It's, it's a theft. Yeah. Yeah. And let me share here. First of all, I'd like to give a special shout out to, of course, my Manuel, who's joining us. We've got Feli uh, Garcia also and Omar Lopez, who's here. And actually, I'd like to pull up this comment here that Omar says. It says here, I was not allowed to speak Spanish, even though it was my first year in the U.S. I was stripped of my tongue, culture and identity. And then he says here, pero ahora... He goes, yo hablo however I want. I, I will talk however I please. And that's something you. that is amazing here. And so I'm, that, I'm excited. That is so powerful, you know, and and that's why I tell teachers the law is on the side of, of the language. You know, the minute a teacher tells a child English only, they're infringing in the children's uh, civil rights when it comes to language. We cannot say that. Um, you know, unless it's an educational justification, like we're taking the Telpas test, it's in English, you know, um, if the child is using it for clarification to speak to the little friends, I mean, think about it if it was us. And this is what I tell teachers. Imagine if you were in Russia and you were not allowed to speak English at all. I mean, can you imagine? Right. Um, yes. Ooh, thank you. LinkedIn user as a ESO coordinator, I encourage my fellow teachers to learn basic Spanish due to our large... I love that. And and by by your teachers learning the language just a little bit, right? What does it do? It validates. It validates, you know? So, for example, my son, um, he brought with him his roommate from West Point who's from Cambodia. He's going to be with us. And I've been trying to learn two or three words. It's so hard. His language is so hard to learn. But it shows me, it teaches him that I respect him. I respect his culture. I honor him, you know? And by you doing that, the person that just posted the, the coordinator, um, uh, that is going above and beyond of what we can do for our kids. So I thank you for that. Yeah. And that's something that is so important, you know. And so, you know, having students come into my classroom and I experience, I think I always tell people I really sharpened my skills as a teacher really more when I was at the elementary level going from fifth to sixth grade and being in fifth grade. I remember that, you know, we would get students and and here, of course, we have high demographic area, very close to the border, um, you know, Spanish speaking. They come into the class, but sometimes, you know, what bothered me sometimes and, and I'm just speaking honestly and truthfully, I'm not going to, you know, because I know we've experienced this, but sometimes there are teachers out there that don't have patience with the students or again, may not validate or feel like, oh my gosh, the, the, you know, the student is holding me back from going through my lessons because they don't understand. However, I took those kids and, and I loved them to death. And I offered multiple ways that they can go ahead and share their learning and their knowledge. So, and here's a story that I love to share. We had a set of twins and one twin was in my pod. The other twin was in another pod. I taught science. The other twin uh, had science also with a different teacher. They were more worksheet, 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 and just rogue memorization. Where my class, I was that one teacher that checked out the Chromebooks all year long. And so 
I knew that she did not feel comfortable speaking or reading, which is okay. But when I would put the Chromebook in front of her and she created a presentation, she spoke loudly and she spoke clearly and she had just just amazing being able to explain her learning, the experience, everything was there. And little by little, slowly, she built up that confidence till one day she's like, Mr. Mendoza, quiero presentar. I was like, okay. She got up there and she presented. And mind you, they were twins. I think they had some meetings also. And I was able to have artifacts of her from when she started with me till the, you know, towards the end of the school year. So not only did I have her language because we would use Screencastify so they would record themselves. So I had evidence of her growth from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. But the only thing different was is that I offered a different modality for her to be able to express her learning. And she built up that confidence. And then she was up there, a little star presenting and building up that language. And to me, that was just so powerful. And so that that to me is, I'll never forget that, that experience. And now we see it. We have the technology to be able to do these things. We have the, the ability to get those learning artifacts and see our student growth. But we're still... or just like uh, and, we're still holding and, back for some reason and i and i love your example and i love your story and so what you were using is what we call in the world of bilingual education is shelter instruction so for example this is what i tell my teachers this is blue verdad this is blue this is blue in french chinese german arabic the knowledge doesn't change the knowledge is there right your student had the knowledge no matter what. The only thing she didn't know is the language. And, and so the mindset is that teachers, I hope, and I work hard every single day to help some of them understand, right? That knowledge is transferable, okay? And so, let, so you know, I love how you're sharing stories because I'm like, I love, I'm a storyteller. So I remember having a session once and the teacher sharing with me, she said, you know, I have a student that just got here from Honduras. I've had him for two months. And he still doesn't speak English. I think I'm going to recommend him to special ed. And I about had a stroke, right? So I had to explain to her. I said, let's say you and me, ma'am, right now, this is before COVID. You and me, we go to France. And we go to France and we're going to go live in France for five years. Okay? Just everything's going to work out. Just don't think about your family. Just, just make believe. As soon as you and I step foot on France, like on the land, did, did all our knowledge disappear? Like your college degree, is it gone? Your knowledge, is it gone? She said, no, I mean, no, why would it be gone? I said, exactly. But do you know French? She said, no, I don't. I said, okay. So then we're going to consider you as ignorant. You don't know anything. And that is the secret that just because you come in from another country and you don't speak the language doesn't mean you're not smart. You're probably smarter than a lot of people. The only thing is that you don't know the language, right? And how do we learn to speak the language is exactly how you're saying it. You're showing the students what they're learning, but you're showing them pictures, words to make connections. Oh, my teacher means this, right? And that is what is called culturally responsive teaching, you know, and Alfonso, let me tell you, there are teachers that are not ESL certified, are not bilingual certified, and they have that gift that they know about that, you know, that, okay, I'm going to figure out a way to get this child to understand what I'm saying, because I know they understand what I'm saying. And, and research actually shows that in, in the long run, children that are learning two lang languages outperform children who only know one. I mean, that's a fact, right? Uh, so I want to thank you for doing that. And I want to commend you um, for doing that, you know, just giving children an opportunity. And another thing that I that I see, like, you know, you shared that with me, some teachers are like, I know I have another one. Oh, my God, you know, yes, I'm another otro. like, like, it's this huge burden, you know, mm -hmm. and it's no, not, it's it, not. It's not. And I, and I agree with you. And that's what I experienced. I mean, I know the system isn't perfect, but, you know, as teachers, 
you know, we need, there are students there, you know, one of the things that I learned is, you know, some people would say, oh, well, that's your student or that's my student. I was like, no, 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 there are students. I was like, just because they're in my class, they're not in yours. It's there are students. So we need, isn't it our job to help them all succeed and give them the same opportunities? And I'm sure, I'm sure your heart was breaking for the other twin. Yes. Like, I know you were thinking, darn, man, if that other twin was with me, mm-hmm. you know, because I, I, you know, I go all over the state of Texas and I see, you know, and I'm like, oh, this teacher, I love this teacher. Can we just multiply this teacher times 50? And, you know, so I know you were thinking. No, <sighs> yeah. And, and yes, uh, you know, even, even the, the parents were thankful, at, but not only that, but the, when they had their meetings, they they noticed the difference in the language acquisition between both one. you know sisters obviously one because of the technology and just kind of putting at a level playing field and just finding her comfort zone like i said the knowledge was there she just didn't feel comfortable presenting it all in english and, and you i were, get that and you were giving her informal assessments yeah. okay tell me and, how you know what you know in your language and, and yeah. And then that's why I said, I was like with the Chromebooks and Google slides, and she spoke loudly and she spoke volumes where the other sister, you know, like I said, it was just worksheet after worksheet, rogue memorization. And you can even tell the difference in, in that growth. And like I said, I had seen the learning artifacts. It was just amazing. But not only that, but the, her confidence, you know, what the day that she was ready and said, Mr. Mendoza, Mr. Mendoza, I can present. I was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I even recorded it and shared it with everybody, like all the teachers and said, look, this is what it's all about, you know, seeing the growth and it's there. And yeah, but like, like you said, my heart did break because, you know, if I had both of them, I was like, oh my goodness, that would have been wonderful. You know? Because so I know, I know what she was thinking, the other one, why can't I be in his class? I already can already think of that. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, why, why can't, so you know, sometimes I tell teachers, if you really are struggling with your students, sometimes you have to stop and think and say, what if this was my child? What if this was my sister's kid? You know, look at them in that way if you have to, you know, but figure out a way because, and then at the end of the day, I tell teachers, guess what? If you didn't have those kids, those kids that you complain about, we wouldn't have a job, right? So it's like different angles. Of course, the main thing is we want to do what's right for kids and you know, I always tell myself, I always told myself, I want to be the kind of teacher that 30 years from now, somebody calls me and says, hey, I made it to the top. And it's because you were so awesome with me. I never want to be somebody giving a keynote somewhere and saying, I had the worst teacher and her name was, you know, do you want to be that teacher? Or do you want to be the one that they're looking for because they want you to show up and they just want to say thank you, you know, um, so, yeah. So thank you for sharing all that with me and bringing that up, because that is something that we all have to um, yeah. strive for, you know? Yeah. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about, you know, here, the bilingual, and because this is what you do. You also train teachers. And now I, I kind of just want to bring this up because I see that there's a lot of school districts. That bilingual test has caused some issues. And in the fact that because either the teacher has not passed that exam, they've had to reshuffle and re just move people around. And now you're getting some teachers that have never taught a certain subject or a grade level because they have to move those teachers because they're not bilingual certified. Tell me from your experience, what have you seen? Is this something that you see during your training? Well, what makes this test so hard? Well, there's two different kinds of tests. Okay, Okay. so one test is the ESL test. To be an ESL certified teacher, you do not need to speak any other language. Okay, any foreign language, just English. Mm -hmm. And that test is based just on pedagogy, how to teach students to speak English and to learn English. Um, The BTLPT, okay, and, and for ESL, you can teach middle school and high school. You can also teach elementary, but it has to be a dual language campus and it has to be you can only teach in English. So it's pretty much just English the whole way. The BTLPT certification is two tests. The bilingual supplemental, which is kind of like the ESL uh, test. It's all in English. But the other one is the BTLPT. Okay. Um, That one is completely in Spanish. Now, I don't know who created the test and what they were thinking, 
but I took that test and I took it in 2013 when it had just been out for two years. And when I took it and I, and you know, again, I was born and raised in Mexico. I, I, my parents would put me in school in Mexico in the summer in elementary. And I remember leaving there and thinking, you know, cause my, my daughter, she's a nurse, she's bilingual, completely bilingual. And I remember thinking, wow, I don't know if Alexa would pass this test, you know? And as I, as I got in my car, I was thinking, wow, this is going to cause, cause a huge shortage in the state of Texas. Okay, well, I passed the test, right? But I thought it was very hard. Now, I, I, I do support teachers on this test just because, number one, I feel the test is insanely difficult. Uh, whoever was a part of it, um, with all due respect, I don't know what they were thinking. Um, you know, trying to make sure that a teacher is at that level of Spanish, you know, are they going to be a college professor for Spanish? No, you know, um, and so when I meet teachers that finally hire, you know, districts that hire me or teachers that finally reach out to me, sometimes I'll even help them for free because I feel so bad in their, in their situation. Um, but they have to basically speak in Spanish in academic content. They have to write in Spanish. They have to listen and they have to read. And it's very high academic Spanish. So this is the thing that I tell my teachers because I've already taken the test. Um, you know, I've done so many hundreds of sessions. I tell my teachers, when you train with me, pasas porque pasas. The only way you will not pass the BTLPT is if you do not speak Spanish. If you, you know, I've had teachers tell me, I don't understand a word you're saying, you know, and I'm like, okay, then you should take the ESL because to pass the Spanish, you have to be, you know, Spanish literate. You have to write Spanish, speak in Spanish. Um, but it's just the way that I teach them, depending on the level, if they're very high academic or if they're not very high academic. Um, and it's also a mindset. But it breaks my heart. Like, it breaks my heart to find that there's teachers who cannot teach bilingual kids because they cannot pass this test that is not telling me whether they're a good teacher or not. All it's telling me is whether they're amazing in Spanish or not, whether they can go to Mexico City and live there for the rest of their lives. Um, I don't see the connection in the actual content with teachers. And I did hear before COVID, they were starting a committee because they realized, you know, the state that the test is insane and they are looking at options, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. Um, so, you know, everybody that I support, I mean, I, 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 and I, and I tell people I'm one of the only, uh, consultants in the state of Texas that has taken this new test, not from the nineties, like the new test in the 2013, um, and conmigo pasan porque pasan, but just seeing their, their stress and their fear, um, and their loss of hope is really heartbreaking for me. Yeah, it really is heartbreaking because a lot of teachers, it's like, oh, my goodness, like I've been teaching this grade level for, you know, this is my comfort zone. This is where I've been. This, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, we're going to have to move you to this other grade level that you've never taught or even moving them to a subject that they're not familiar with or things of that sort. And it just shuffles, you know, everything. It, it causes it causes chaos. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. It really does. And sometimes when you have a teacher's not comfortable I mean, the kids, they read it, they know it, they feel it, and it just adds that more more pressure on the teachers. And I think that that's something that's very yeah, unfair. And, and the test, if the test was different, if it had a different format, maybe ask, then I could understand, okay? I just want to know that the teacher can communicate to the child in Spanish at a certain mm -hmm. level. But the test, you know, it, it's another level. Like, like I said, when I took it and I walked out, I was like, I was even thinking, and it was like 2013, almost 10 years ago. And I remember walking out thinking, oh my gosh, there's going to be a shortage in the state of Texas. With I mean, I, and I was, you know, not, I was just thinking to myself and now the time is here. Right. Um, so I do offer a lot of sessions and sometimes I'm not going to lie. I'll have somebody that'll message me. Um, from different districts and they'll be like, I'm on my fifth try, ma'am. If I don't pass this fifth time, I don't have a job. And we can't wait, you know, for the district to hire me or maybe they're paraprofessionals. And if I have the time, which I usually find the time, I'm like, you know what, call me, we'll do a 30 minute fast and furious and I'll give you all that you need to pass. Um, because our kids, meanwhile, our kids are waiting for them. You know, that's the worst part that our kids, our students are missing out from amazing teachers because they're waiting for them to pass this insane test. Yeah, yeah. no, I agree. 
All right, my friend. Well, let's talk a little bit about this because, uh, I mean, aside from this, you do your own consulting. Now you have your company, which is amazing that I have seen grow. And especially now through the times of COVID, just your the growth that you've had, the impact. I mean, you're working with students, you're working with teachers, you're working with various districts, and you're just bringing that energy that it's the Dr. E.T. effect. That's I guess, <laughs> and that's what I'm going to have to call it because you have a certain effect. And even though I've seen you present, you know, at region one and so on, you just have this effect and a way of really making those connections with people. So talk to us about your business and how that came to fruition. You know, tell, I, I, I'm, I want to hear the story. When did you just say, you know what? Vámonos, orale, this is where we're going to well, start. Um, I've never really shared with people, but my very first time I presented in front of an audience was when I was seven years old in first grade. I was in a bilingual class and my teacher's name was Mrs. McGuire. And she gave me a little paper to read in Spanish to the parents. And so she validated my language and my culture, and I will always be grateful to her. And then since then, as a teacher, I, I mean, uh, as a college student, I would, you know, be asked to present, like when I lived in uh, Edinburgh University, that's where I went to school. Um, the professors asked me to talk about culture with, you know, all of the students because my husband and I were the only Mexican Americans in the little college town. Um, and then as a teacher, I would um, submit proposals like to Region One or to conferences here and there. I would get accepted. I would go present. And then, um, you know, eventually work took me to do this type of work at a district level and then, of course, to the region um, I was working insane hours. I really was. Um, uh, barely had Sundays off. And I remember my son telling me, Mom, are you the only one working there or what? I was like, no. And I just knew in my heart that it was time to start my own company. And I really wanted to write books. And I had absolutely no time at Region 1. Everything I was creating was for them. Um, so I remember I prayed about it. And I was like, you know what? It's time. And um, I was actually supposed to resign in May, but I resigned in, in March because my workload um, got smaller, you know, um, because I guess I was leaving. And um, and then the crazy thing was that COVID started like two days after I resigned. So that was so scary for me. But as you know, you know, even in dark times, we have to continue. Right? So I just kept going. I created sessions. I would offer free sessions. I would try to learn more. I kept writing. Um, and then eventually, you know, districts started hiring me. And um, one thing that I like to share about Dr. E.T. and company is that we keep it fresh. You know, every year I have new sessions. You know, if I've already presented at your district and you ask me to go present on shelter instruction, the next year it's going to be different. It's not going to be the same exact session. Um, because I remember as a teacher, I, again, I use a lot of the experience that I had as a teacher going to sessions as a teacher and I'd be like, oh, I had this session two years ago, the same one, you know? So I challenged myself to keep it fresh, to always create new material. Um, and that's what I'm working on during the holidays because in 2021, we're going to have um, even more um, new sessions um, to offer our teachers. Because again, as a teacher, I remember Fonzie, I remember dreading PD. I would be like, oh, another PD day. I'm going to work on my bills, you know, and that's I remember that. And I remember I would find it very disrespectful to go to a training that was boring to me. I'd be like, what? You took me out of my kid of my classroom with my students for this, you know, and so that's always in the back of my mind. And my biggest, most amazing gift from teachers is when they come up to me and they tell me, ma'am, I'm going to be honest with you. This is the first time ever that I didn't work on my emails or that I didn't work on my bills or that I didn't whatever. I didn't even, I was just hooked on what you said the whole time. That's the goal, right? Because we want teachers to come back energized and excited. Um, and so I do a lot of everything, I guess, because I've taught every grade, every subject, um, you know, um, I do telpas, I do PTLPT, supplementals, shelter and instruction, Oh yeah, that's me. Oh, thank you. And then I tell, and then I tell districts, if there's a, if there's a session that you want, if you dream it, I can create it. You know, there's nothing that we cannot do. Um, we will do it. And those are some of my workbooks. Um, the one in the middle at the top made top 100, uh, during COVID, um, at, on Amazon. And you can find a lot of my work on Amazon. You just type in my name, Edith Trevino, and then they all pop up. 
there's actually like two or three more um, that we haven't added on there. But um, again, I'm always thinking of myself as a teacher, what I wanted, what did I want as a teacher? What was I, ex because I was always very critical in sessions and I can look back, you know, so for example, Feli, she's here right now, you know, when she would come out and present, I would be like, wow, another level. That's what we want. You know, we don't want, oh my God, I'm so bored. No. And so I'm very critical of myself. I make sure. And, and that's why now one of my new models is welcome to the best of the best. <laughs> um, because, because to me, teachers are up here. You know, I was a teacher for 20, 25 years. I know how it is. And, and I know the struggles that we have, and I know that everything that we go through. So if you're going to have, you're going to come into my session, it's going to be different. It's going to be, um, you know, another level, taking it to the best level, to the next level. And you're going to come back to your classroom and you're going to be empowered. And really, that's what we want. Because as a teacher, I would sometimes I'd be in tough situations and I would be like, I need to motivate myself. How can I motivate myself? And I would just struggle real hard to figure out ways to do that. So, yeah. So I do social emotional. I'm certified for that, too. Um, basically everything, you know. Except calculus and algebra. I won't, I can't, I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I love it. You know, so guys, make sure you check it out. You will see all the information on the show notes also as well. So you can get in contact with Dr. E.T. But, you know, seeing all the books that you put out, I mean, it is amazing. So you literally took what Dr. Jewett says, right? Like the wind. Yes. You definitely took it to that level, my and, friend. And I, I love it. And, and, and yes, I love Dr. Jewett, the most amazing professor and chair of all times. And let me just shout out to her because when I was looking at my research on border violence and I remember I wrote a narrative and other professors had told me, no, do not write about that. No. And I remember she read a narrative and she said, you know, this is a very powerful topic, something that is needed here in our region. And I said, what? She said, why don't you write about that? And I said, well, I have wanted to, but sometimes people tell me it's too, it's too painful or, or, oh, it's not. She's like, this is a very important topic, a very important work. So I love her for pushing me, um, for opening the doors to me, you know. And one of my my new workbooks that are coming up, one of them is titled Unstoppable. That's for recent immigrants and students. And then the other one for teachers on social emotional, um, the title of that is What's Your Story? I cannot wait um, to share those with everybody. And they're very short reads, you know, 20, 25 pages, little mindsets. Um, one of my most popular ones is I'm okay is not okay. Um, you know, but I love to write. So when I left region one, one, one of the first things I said I'm leaving is because I need to write. And sure enough, I mean, they can't say I, I was lying because I've published over, I don't know, 15 workbooks, books. I call them workbooks because they're not like a dissertation, you know, they're not thick. Um, but I published from 15 to 20, can't even keep up. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Well, I'm just so excited and I'm just so thrilled, you know, that you found some time to join me here today and just talk about your passion for my audience, you know, that is watching or going to rewatch this or view it later, listen to it, that they get to connect with you and just hear your heart, your passion, where you're coming from, and that they're able to connect with you. And hopefully, like I said, you know, open up more doors as I mean, I know you're busy, at, but you know what, 2022 is, uh, you know, right around the corner. And, you know, I just wish you nothing but success. Pues siempre para arriba, siempre para adelante y nuevo para, nunca para atrás, mi amiga. So, sí, muchas gracias, excited. muchas gracias, amigo, for being there for me even before you know my company started. You were one of the few people that um, you know a lot of people don't know that I was not even technology savvy when when I met you. I was not as how I am now, and you would always lend a hand, you know. And so for that, I'm always forever grateful. Hi, my, my amiga, mi amiga. That's what it's all about. Sharing means caring. And again, thank you so much. But we're not done yet, okay? Because usually what I do is I love to kind of wind down the episode with just a couple more questions and just to kind of put you on the spot, but not too, too much on the spot. So my first question to you, Dr. E.T., would be is if you can turn one of your hobbies, okay, one of your hobbies I know you're very busy, so I don't know if you do have a hobby, but if you can turn one of your hobbies into a profession, what would it be? One of my hobbies into a profession. I, well, I love to read. I mean, that is like, I love to read. And sometimes I don't have time to read, so I have to get my books on Audible, and that's how I l listen. There so if, 
if that would be my profession, I guess it would be reading the books that I love to people. Perfect. Professional reader. That's awesome. Hey, maybe a, a voice over, you know, actor too as well. Be Ajá, able no to read those sé, books. no sé, porque, mira, I have a, a, in Spanish, I speak very Norteña because I'm from Coahuila. So uh -huh. I'm sure your mom will tell you that. Oh, yeah. I didn't even, I didn't even know that I spoke Norteño until I go visit my family in Mexico City in Puebla. And they're like, oh, yeah, estás enojada. And I'm like, no, por qué? They're like, es que hablas como que estás enojada. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I guess. From northern Mexico, we speak like that. And then in English, pues tengo mi accent, right? <laughs> so I don't know if I could be recording myself to read, but yeah, I guess to read the books to people. And I guess, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. All right, next question. What would you say right now is currently your edu kryptonite? In other words, what what is that one thing that just kind of just makes you weak? Something that's happening in education. What <sighs> would that be? Honestly, the the lack of validation of student language and culture that it's like somebody punches me in the stomach you know when somebody doesn't validate and value the student's culture the student's language that really is like punching me in the stomach right. especially when i see it from kids themselves all right. Good answer. Good answer. And the last question, my friend, is if this was your podcast or your show right now and I was your guest on your show, what would be one question you'd like to ask me? I would like to ask you what what drives you in this world of education? Like, what's your drive? Oh, my drive is just... I have a passion for education. This is funny because they, they asked me the same question yesterday, the guest did. And I don't know, it's just a recurring theme. But the more I thought about it, it and I even put something up on TikTok, is just, I, I'm, I feel like I am addicted to learning. And that is where my passion is from. Like, I don't know, if I, I think that comes from my parents always saying, mijo, mijo, I don't want you to be like us. No quiero, que, no quiero que trabajes en oficina. Quiero que estés en aire acondicionado. No quiero que estés en el sol. You know, they never wanted me to work outside in the fields doing odd jobs and so on. And so in my continued pursuits of making them proud, it's like, like to me, it just feels like I've never stopped. Like I have so much more to give. But when I fell into education, I absolutely fell in love with every aspect. And I know it's not a perfect system, but I fell in love with it so much because it's giving me so much. And my drive is to continue learning, much like you said, to give back to the community, to make that change, to have those conversations where, you know, let's change for the better and let's do it together and showing people that it is possible so for me, that is really where my passion for what I do comes from. And, and obviously with connecting with wonderful educators such as yourself and others worldwide and some even the guests that are here, you know, that I've been able to connect with. That is my drive. Just change that is, education that is for true. the better. <laughs> and I know for a fact that is true because when we met, you know, you were there uh, at, at our service. You know, what do you guys need? What, what do you need? Que necesitan? Let me help you. Let me show you. Um, servicial, you know, the way that you are with your students and the way that you are also not just with your students, but with us to the point that, you know, I remember that. So that's, that's pretty amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, my friend. I really Fue un honor que me invitaras, like for real. Last time I was like, hi, mira, yo todavía no salgo en el, my tech life. And then you messaged me. So I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Yes. And I'm just so excited. Like I said, just from one passionate educator to another passionate educator who just sees the amazing work that you're doing. And, you know, I'm just excited for what 2022 is going to bring for you because I know you've been doing a lot of keynotes. You've been doing a lot of work and, you know, just what you're doing is amazing. And that's, that's what it's all about being those change agents going out there and just sharing our passion with people and igniting that spark into some of those that maybe during this time, I mean, I know it was a tough time to go transition due to COVID, but maybe just, you know, echándole, echándole spark de nuevo otra vez. That <laughs> echándole, way keep going. echándole ganas. That's there right. That's, that's the only way we, we know how, right. We just got to exactly. keep going. We keep moving forward every single day and honor our ancestors on the on the way.
Exactly. Well, thank you so much, my friends. We have come to the end of this wonderful show. I really appreciate you joining us. Omar, Feli, Manny, and everybody else that joined us today with your comments. Amanda, thank you. I really appreciate you uh, being here, being part of the chat and so on. So make sure that you check out Dr. E.T.'s website, check out her books, visit her page, stay connected, connect with her. She's wonderful. Even reach out to her, DM her. She is amazing. So again, you're definitely going to find uh, just this this spark. She's she's a spark plug. It's una chispa and you're definitely, she's amazing. So I appreciate every single one of you. And my friends, like as I always tell you all, until next time, don't forget, Stay techie.